Chapter 7 A hushed feeling of awe at the cathedral spaciousness of the cave overcame the clan when they first walked into their new quarters, but they soon grew accustomed to it. Thoughts of the old cave and their anxious search receded quickly, and the more they learned about the environment of their new home, the more pleased they became with it. They settled into the usual routine of the short, hot summers, hunting, gathering, and storing food to carry them through the long, freezing cold which they knew from past experience lay ahead. They had a bountiful variety from which to choose. Silver trout flashed through the white spray of the riotous stream, tickled out of the water by hand with infinite patience as the unwary fish rested under overhanging roots and rocks. Giant sturgeon and salmon, often filled with a bonus of fresh black caviar or bright pink roe, hovered near the stream's mouth, while monstrous catfish and black cod swept the bottom of the inland sea. Sane nets, made from the long hair of animals, hand-twisted into cord, strained the large fish from the water as they darted away from waders herding them toward the barrier of knotted strands. They often hiked the ten easy miles to the sea coast, and soon had a supply of salty fish dried over smoky fires stored away. Mollusks and crustaceans were collected for ladles, spoons, bowls, and cups, as well as for their succulent morsels. Craggy cliffs were scaled to collect eggs from the multitude of seabirds nesting on the rocky promontories facing the water, and an occasional well-aimed stone brought an added treat of gannet, gull, or great auk. Roots, fleshy stems, and leaves, squashes, legumes, berries, fruits, nuts, and grains were each collected in their season as the summer ripened. Leaves and flowers and herbs were dried for teas and flavorings, and sandy chunks of salt, left high and dry when the great northern glacier robbed moisture and caused coastlines to recede, were carried back to the cave to season winter fare. The hunters went out often. The nearby steppes, rich in grasses and herbs and bereft of all but an occasional stand of stunted trees, abounded in herds of grazing animals. Giant deer ranged the grassy plains, their huge palmate antlers spreading as much as eleven feet in the larger animals, along with oversized bison with horn spreads of similar dimensions. Steppe horses seldom traveled so far south, but asses and onagers, the half-ass intermediate between horses and asses, roamed the open plains of the peninsula, while their massive robust cousin, the forest horse, lived singly or in small family groups nearer the cave. The steppes also hosted in frequent smaller bands of the lowland-dwelling relative of the goat, the saiga antelope. The parkland between prairie and foothills was home to oryx, the dark brown or black wild cattle that were the ancestors of gentler domestic breeds. The forest rhinoceros, Related to brush-browsing later tropical species, but adapted to cool, temperate forests, overlapped only slightly the territory of another variety of rhinos that preferred the grass of the parkland. Both, with their shorter, upright snout horns and horizontal head carriage, differed from the woolly rhino, which, along with the woolly mammoths, were only seasonal visitors. They had a long anterior horn set at a forward-sloping angle, and a downward head carriage useful for sweeping snow away from winter pastures. Their thick layer of subcutaneous fat and their deep red, long-haired overcoat and soft woolly undercoat were adaptations that confined them to cold climates. Their natural habitat was the northern freeze-dried steppes, the lowest steppes. Only when glaciers were on the land could there be lowest steps. The constant low pressure over the vast sheets of ice sucked moisture from the air, allowing little snow to fall in paraglacial regions and creating a constant wind. Fine calcareous dust, lois, was picked up from the crushed rock at the edges of the glaciers and deposited for hundreds of miles. A short spring melted the scant snow and the top layer of permafrost enough for fast-rooting grasses and herbs to sprout. They grew quickly and dried into standing hay. 
thousands upon thousands of acre of fodder for the millions of animals that had adapted to the freezing cold of the continent. The continental steppes of the peninsula only beckoned the woolly beasts in late fall. The summers were too hot, and the heavy snows of winter were too deep to brush away. Many other animals were driven north in winter to the borders of the colder but drier Lois. Most of them migrated back in summer. The forest animals, who could browse on brush or bark or lichen, stayed on the wooded slopes that offered seclusion and precluded large herds. Besides forest horses and forest rhinos, wild pigs and several varieties of deer found a home in the tree-filled landscape. Red deer, later called elk in other lands, in small herds, individuals and small groups of shy roe deer with simple three-pointed antlers, the slightly larger fawn and white dappled fallow deer, and a few elk, referred to as moose by those who call the red deer elk, all shared the wooded environment. Higher up the mountains, large horned sheep, mouflon, clung to crags and outcrops, feeding on alpine pastures. And higher still, ibex, the wild mountain goat, and chamois gambled from precipice to precipice. Darting swift-winged birds lent color and song to the forest, if not often a meal. Their place on the menu was more easily satisfied by the fat, low-flying ptarmigan and willow grouse of the steppes brought down by swift stones, and the autumn visitations of geese and eider ducks snared by nets as they landed on marshy mountain ponds. Birds of prey and carrion eaters floated lazily on thermal updrafts, scanning the bountiful plains and woodlands below. A host of smaller animals filled the mountains and steppes near the cave, providing food and fur. Hunters, minks, otters, wolverines, ermines, martens, foxes, sables, raccoons, badgers, and the small wild cats that later gave rise to legions of domestic mouse chasers, and hunted. Tree squirrels, porcupines, hares, rabbits, moles, muskrats, koipu, beavers, skunks, mice, voles, lemmings, ground squirrels, great jerboas, giant hamsters, pikas, and a few never named and lost to extinction. Larger carnivores were essential to thin the ranks of the abundant prey. There were wolves and their more ferocious relatives, the dog-like doles, and there were cats lynxes, cheetahs, tigers, leopards, mountain-dwelling snow leopards, and, twice as large as any, cave lions. Omnivorous brown bears hunted near the cave, but their overgrown cousins, the vegetarian cave bears, were now absent. The ubiquitous cave hyena filled out the complement of wildlife. The land was unbelievably rich, and man only an insignificant fraction of the multifarious life that lived and died in that cold, ancient Eden. Born too raw, without superior natural endowments for it, save one, his oversized brain, he was the weakest of the hunters. But for all his apparent vulnerability, lacking fang or claw or swift leg or leaping strength, the two-legged hunter had gained the respect of his four-legged competitors. His scent alone was enough to veer a far more powerful creature from a chosen path wherever the two lived in close proximity for very long. The capable, experienced hunters of the clan were as skilled in defense as they were in offense, and when the safety or security of the clan was threatened, or if they wanted a warm winter coat decorated by nature, they stalked the unsuspecting stalker. It was a bright sunlit day, warm with the beginning fullness of summer. The trees were leafed out, but still a shade lighter than they would be later. Lazy flies buzzed around scattered bones from previous meals. A fresh breeze from the sea carried a hint of the life within it, and the moving foliage sent shadows chasing across the sunny slope in front of the cave. With the crisis of finding a new home over, Magur's duties were light. All that was required of him was an occasional hunting ceremony or ritual to drive away evil spirits or, if someone was hurt or ill, to ask the assistance of beneficent ones to aid Iza's healing magic. 
The hunters were gone and several of the women with them. They would not be back for many days. The women went along to preserve the meat after it was killed. Game was easier to bring home already dried for winter storage. The warm sun and ever-present wind on the steppes quickly desiccated meat cut into thin strips. Smoky fires of dried grass and dung were more for keeping away blowflies that laid eggs in fresh meat, making it rot. The women would also carry most of the load on the way back. Kreb had spent time with Ayla nearly every day since they moved into the cave, trying to teach her their language. The rudimentary words, usually the more difficult part for clan youngsters, she picked up with ease, but their intricate system of gestures and signals was beyond her. He had tried to make her understand the meaning of gestures, but neither had a basis in each other's method of communicating, and there was no one to interpret or explain. The old man had racked his brain, but he had not been able to think of a way to get the meanings across. Ayla was equally frustrated. She knew there was something she was missing, and she ached to be able to communicate beyond the few words she knew. It was obvious to her that the people of the clan understood more than the simple words, but she just didn't know how. The problem was that she didn't see the hand signals. They were random movements to her, not purposeful motions. She simply hadn't been able to grasp the concept of talking with movement. That it was even possible had never occurred to her. It was totally beyond her realm of experience. Crabbe had begun to get an inkling of her problem, though he found it hard to believe. It has to be that she doesn't know the motions have meaning, he thought. Ayla, Kreb called, beckoning to the girl. That must be the trouble, he thought as they walked along a path beside the glinting stream. Either that, or she just isn't intelligent enough to comprehend a language. From his observations, he couldn't believe she lacked intelligence, for all that she was different. But she does understand simple gestures. He had assumed it would only be a matter of enlarging on them. Many feet starting out to hunt, forage, or fish in their direction had already beaten down grass and brush forming a path along the line of least resistance. They came to a spot the old man favored, an open stretch near a large leafy oak whose high exposed roots offered a shaded raised seat easier for him to rest on than lowering himself to the ground. Starting the lesson, he pointed to the tree with his staff. Oak! Ayla quickly responded. Kreb nodded approval, then he aimed his staff at the stream. Water, the girl said. The old man nodded again, then made a motion with his hand and repeated the word. Flowing water, river, the combined gesture and word stated. Water, the girl said hesitantly, puzzled that he had indicated her word was correct but asked her again. She was getting a feeling of panic deep in her stomach. It was the same as before. She knew there was something more he wanted, but she didn't understand. Kreb shook his head no. He had gone over the same kind of exercises with the child many times. He tried again, pointing to her feet. Feet, Ayla said. Yes, the magician nodded. Somehow I must make her see as well as hear, he thought. Getting up, he took her hand and walked a few steps with her, leaving his staff behind. He made a motion and said the word, Feet, moving feet, walking, was the sense he was trying to communicate. She strained to listen, trying to hear if there was something she missed in his tone. Feet? the child said tremulously, sure it was not the answer he wanted. No, 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 walking, feet moving, he repeated again, looking directly at her, exaggerating the gesture. He moved her forward again, pointing at her feet, despairing that she would ever learn. Ayla could feel tears begin to well up in her eyes. Feet, feet! She knew it was the right word. Why did he shake his head no? 
I wish he'd stop moving his hand around in front of my face like that. What am I doing wrong? The old man walked her forward again, pointed at her feet, made the motion with his hand, said the word. She stopped and watched him. He made the gesture again. Exaggerating it so much it almost meant something else, said the word again. He was bent over, looking her squarely in the face, making the motion directly in front of her eyes. Gesture, word. Gesture, word. What does he want? What am I supposed to do? She wanted to understand him. She knew he was trying to tell her something. Why does he keep moving his hand? She thought. Then the barest glimmer of an idea came to her. His hand. He keeps moving his hand. She lifted her hand hesitantly. Yes, yes, that's it. Krebs' vigorous affirmative nodding almost shouted. Make the signal. Moving feet, he repeated. With dawning comprehension, she watched his motion, then tried to copy it. Kreb was saying, yes, that's what he wants, the movement. He wants me to make the movement. She made the gesture again, saying the word, not understanding what it meant, but at least understanding that it was the gesture he wanted her to make when she said the word. Kreb turned her around and headed back to the oak, limping heavily. Pointing to her feet again as she moved, he repeated the gesture-word combination once again. Suddenly, like an explosion in her brain, she made the connection. Moving on feet. Walking. That's what he means. Not just feet. The hand movement with the word feet means walking. Her mind raced. She remembered always seeing the people of the clan moving their hands. She could see Isa and Kreb in her mind's eye, standing, looking at each other, moving their hands, saying few words, but moving their hands. Were they talking? Is that how they talk to each other? Is that why they say so little? Do they talk with their hands? Kreb seated himself. Ayla stood in front of him, trying to calm her excitement. Feet, she said, pointing down to hers. Yes, he nodded, wondering. She turned and walked away, and as she approached him again, she made the gesture and said the word, feet. Yes, yes, that's it. That's the idea, he said. She has it. I think she understands. The girl paused for a moment, then turned away and ran away from him. After running back across the small clearing, she waited expectantly in front of him again, a little out of breath. Running, he motioned as she watched carefully. It was a different movement, like the first, but different. Running, her hesitant motion mimicked. She does have it. Kreb was excited. The movement was gross. It lacked the finesse of even the young children of the clan, but she had the idea. He nodded vigorously and was almost knocked off his seat as Ayla threw herself at him, hugging him in joyful understanding. The old magician looked around. It was almost instinctive. Gestures of affection were confined to the boundaries of the fire. But he knew they were alone. The crippled man responded with a gentle hug and felt a glow of warmth and satisfaction he had never felt before. A whole new world of comprehension opened up for Ayla. She had an innate dramatic flair and a talent for mimicry which she put to use with deadly earnest copying Krebs' motions. But Krebs' one-handed speaking gestures were necessarily adaptations of normal hand signals, and it was Isa who taught her the finer details. She learned as a baby would, starting with expressions of simple needs, but she learned much faster. Too long had she been frustrated in her attempts to communicate. She was determined to make up for the lack as quickly as possible. As she began to understand more, the life of the clan sprang into vivid relief. She watched the people around her as they communicated, staring in rapt attention, trying to grasp what they were saying to each other. 
At first, the clan was tolerant of her visual intrusion, treating her like a baby. But as time went on, disapproving glances cast in her direction made it obvious that such ill-mannered behavior would not be accepted much longer. Staring, like eavesdropping, was discourteous. Custom dictated that the eyes should be averted when other people were in private discussion. The problem came to a head one evening in midsummer. The clan was inside the cave, gathered around their family fires after the evening meal. The sun had sunk below the horizon, and the last dim afterglow outlined the leafy silhouettes of dark foliage rustling in the gentle night breeze. The fire at the mouth of the cave, lit to fend off evil spirits, curious predators, and the damp night air, sent up wisps of smoke and shimmering heat waves, making the shadowed black trees and brush beyond undulate to the silent rhythm of the flickering flames. Its light danced with shadows on the rough rock wall of the cave. Ayla sat within the stones that outlined Kreb's territory, staring across at Brun's household. Proud was upset and taking it out on his mother and Oga by exercising his prerogatives as an adult male. The day had started out badly for Browd, and got worse. Long hours spent tracking and stalking were wasted when he missed his shot, and the red fox, whose pelt he had grandly promised to Oga, melted into the dense brush only warned by the swiftly slung stone. Oga's looks of understanding forgiveness just hurt his wounded pride more. He was the one who should be forgiving of her inadequacies, not the other way around. The women, tired from a busy day, were trying to finish their last chores, and Ebra, exasperated by his constant interruptions, made a slight signal to Brun. The leader had been more than aware of the young man's imperious, demanding behavior. It was Browd's right, but Brun felt he should be more sensitive to them. It wasn't necessary to make them run for everything when they were already so busy and tired. Browd. Let the women alone. They have enough to do, Brun signaled in silent reprimand. The rebuke was too much, especially in front of Oga and from Brun. Browd stomped off to the far edge of the territory of Brun's hearth near the boundary stones to sulk and caught sight of Ayla staring directly at him. It didn't matter that Ayla had barely caught the drift of the subtle domestic squabble within the confines of the adjacent household. As far as Browd was concerned, the ugly little interloper had seen him scolded just like a child. It was the final crushing blow to his tender ego. She doesn't even have the courtesy to look away, he thought. Well, she's not the only one who can ignore simple politeness. All the day's frustrations overflowed, and flaunting conventions on purpose, Browd directed a malevolent glare across the boundaries at the girl he detested. Kreb was conscious of the mild spat at Brun's hearth, just as he was aware of all the people in the cave. Most of the time, like background noise, it was filtered out of his consciousness, but anything that involved Ayla sharpened his attention. He knew it had taken deliberate effort and supremely malignant intent for Browd to overcome the conditioning of his entire life and stare directly into the confines of another man's hearth. Browd feels too much animosity toward the child, Kreb thought. For her sake, it is time to teach her some manners. Ayla! Kreb commanded sharply. She jumped at the tone in his voice. Not look other people, he signaled. She was puzzled. Why not look, she queried. Not look, not stare, people not like, he tried to explain, aware that Browd was watching out of the corner of his eye, not even bothering to hide his gloating pleasure at the strong scolding the girl was receiving from Magur. She is favored too much by the magician anyway, Browd thought. If she lived here, I'd show her soon enough how a female is supposed to behave. Want learn talk, Ayla motioned, still puzzled and a little hurt. Kreb knew full well why she had been watching, 
but she had to learn some time. Perhaps it would ease Browd's hatred of her if he saw that she was being rebuked for staring at them. Ayla, not stare, Kreb motioned with a severe look. Bad. Ayla, not talk back when man talks. Bad. Ayla, not look at people at their hearths. Bad. Bad. Understand? Kreb was harsh. He wanted to make his point. He noticed Browd get up and return to the fireplace at Brun's call, obviously in a better mood. Ayla was crushed. Kreb had never been harsh with her. She thought he was pleased that she was learning their language. Now he told her she was bad for watching people and trying to learn more. Confused and hurt, tears welled up, filled her eyes, and overflowed down her cheeks. Isa, Kreb called, concerned. Come here. There's something wrong with Ayla's eyes. The eyes of clan people watered only when something got in them, or if they had colds or suffered from eye disease. He had never seen eyes overflowing with tears of unhappiness. Isa came running up. Look at that. Her eyes are watering. Maybe a spark got into one. You'd better take a look at them, he insisted. Isa was worried, too. Lifting Ayla's eyelids, she peered closely into the child's eyes. I hurt? she asked. The medicine woman could see no sign of inflammation. Nothing appeared to be wrong with her eyes. They were just watering. No, not hurt, Ayla sniffled. She couldn't understand their concern about her eyes, but it made her realize they cared about her even if Kreb did say she was bad. Why Kreb mad, Isa? she sobbed. Must learn, Ayla, Isa explained, looking at the girl seriously. Not polite to stare. Not polite to look at other man's fire. See what other people say at fire. Ayla must learn. When man talk, woman look down. Like this, Isa demonstrated. When man talk, woman do. No ask. Only little ones stare. Babies. Ayla big. Make people angry at Ayla. Kreb angry? Not care for me? She asked, bursting out in fresh tears. Isa was still mystified by the child's watering eyes, but she sensed the girl's confusion. Kreb care for Ayla. Isa too. Kreb teach Ayla. More to learn than talk. Must learn clan ways the woman said, taking the girl in her arms. She held her gently while Ayla cried her hurt, then wiped the girl's wet, swollen eyes with a soft skin and looked into them again to satisfy herself they were all right. "'What's wrong with her eyes?' Kreb asked. "'Is she sick?' "'She thought you didn't like her. She thought you were mad at her. It must have given her a sickness. Maybe light eyes like hers are weak.' but I can't find anything wrong, and she says they don't hurt. I think her eyes watered with sadness, Crab, Isa explained. Sadness? She was so sad because she thought I didn't like her it made her sick? Made her eyes water? The astounded man could hardly believe it, and it filled him with mixed emotions. Was she sickly? She seemed healthy but no one ever got sick because they thought he didn't like them. No one, except Isa, had ever cared for him in that way. People feared him, held him in awe, respected him, but no one had ever wanted him to like them so much their eyes watered. Maybe Isa is right. Maybe her eyes are weak, but her sight is fine. Somehow I must let her know it is for her own good that she learns to behave properly. If she doesn't learn the ways of the clan, Brun will turn her out. It is still within his power. But it doesn't mean I don't like her. I do like her, he admitted to himself. Strange as she is, I like her very much. Ayla shuffled slowly toward the crippled old man. 
nervously looking down at her feet. She stood in front of him, then looked up with sad round eyes, still wet with tears. I not stare any more, she gestured. Kreb not mad? No, he signaled. I'm not mad, Ayla, but you belong to the clan now. You belong to me. You must learn the language, but you must learn clan ways too. Understand? I belong Kreb? Kreb care for me? She asked. Yes, I like you, Ayla. The girl broke into a smile, reached out and hugged him, then crawled into the lap of the disfigured, misshapen man and snuggled close. Kreb had always had an interest in children. In his function as Mogur, he seldom revealed a child's totem that wasn't immediately understood by the child's mother as appropriate. The clan attributed Mogur's skill to his magical powers, but his real skill lay in his powers of perceptive observation. He was aware of children from the day they were born, and often saw women and men alike cuddling and comforting them. But the old cripple never knew the joy of cradling a child in his own arms. The little girl, worn out by her emotions, had fallen asleep. She felt secure with the fearsome magician. He had replaced in her heart a man she no longer remembered except in some unconscious corner. As Kreb looked at the peaceful, trusting face of the strange girl in his lap, he felt a deep love flowering in his soul for her. He couldn't have loved her more if she were his own. Isa, the man called out softly. The woman took the sleeping child from Kreb, but not before he hugged her to him for a moment. Her illness has made her tired, he said after the woman laid her down. Make sure she rests tomorrow, and you'd better examine her eyes again in the morning. Yes, Kreb, she nodded. Isa loved her crippled sibling. She knew more than anyone the gentle soul that lived beneath the grim exterior. It made her happy that he had found someone to love, someone who loved him too, and it made her feelings for the girl stronger. Not since she was a little girl herself could Isa remember being so happy. Only her nagging fear that the child she was carrying would be male marred her joy. A son born to her would have to be raised by a hunter. She was Brun's sibling. Their mother had been the mate of the leader before him. If something happened to Browd, or if the woman he mated produced no male offspring, the leadership of the clan would fall to her son, if she had one. Brun would be forced to give her and the baby to one of the hunters or take her in himself. Every day she asked her totem to make her unborn baby a girl, but she couldn't rid herself of her worry. As the summer progressed, with Kreb's gentle patience and Ayla's eager willingness, the girl began to understand not only the language but the customs of her adopted people. Learning to avert her eyes to allow the people of the clan the only privacy possible to them was only the first of many hard lessons. Much more difficult was learning to curb her natural curiosity and impetuous enthusiasm to conform to the customary docility of females. Kreb and Isa were learning, too. They discovered that when Ayla made a certain grimace, pulling back her lips and showing her teeth, often accompanied by peculiar aspirating sounds, it meant she was happy, not hostile. They never completely overcame their anxiety at the strange weakness of her eyes that made them water when she was sad. Isa decided the weakness was peculiar to light-colored eyes, and wondered if the trait was normal for the others, or if only Ayla's eyes watered. To be safe, Isa flushed her eyes with the clear fluid from the bluish-white plant that grew deep in shaded woods. The corpse-like plant derived nourishment from decaying wood and vegetable matter since it lacked chlorophyll, and its waxy-looking surface turned black when touched. But Isa knew of no better remedy for sore or inflamed eyes than the cool liquid that oozed from its broken stem, and applied the treatment whenever the child cried. She didn't cry often. Though tears quickly brought her attention, Ayla tried hard to control them. 
Not only were they disturbing to the two people she loved, but to the rest of the clan it was a sign of her differentness, and she wanted to fit in and be accepted. The clan was learning to accept her, but they were still wary and suspicious of her peculiarities. Ayla was getting to know the clan and accept them, too. Though the men were curious about her, it was beneath their dignity to show too much interest in a female child, no matter how unusual, and she ignored them as much as they ignored her. Brun showed more interest than the rest, but he frightened her. He was stern and not open to advances the way Kreb was. She couldn't know that to the rest of the clan, Mogur appeared far more aloof and forbidding than Brun, and they were amazed at the closeness that developed between the awesome magician and the strange little girl. The one she especially disliked was the young man who shared Brun's fire. Browd always looked mean when he looked at her. It was the women she became familiar with first. She spent more time with them. Except when she was within the boundaries of Crab's hearthstones, or when the medicine woman took her along when she went to gather the plants unique to her own uses, she and Isa were usually with the female members of the clan. In the beginning, Ayla just followed Isa around and watched while they skinned animals, cured hides, stretched thongs cut in one spiral piece from a single hide, wove baskets, mats, or nets, gouged bowls out of logs, gathered wild foods, prepared meals, preserved meat and plant food for winter, and responded to the wishes of any man who called upon them to perform a service. But as they saw the girl's willingness to learn, they not only helped her with the language, they began to teach her those useful skills. She was not as strong as clan women or children. Her thinner frame couldn't support the powerful musculature of the heavy-boned clan, but she was surprisingly dexterous and limber. The heavy tasks were difficult for her, but for a child she did well weaving baskets or cutting out thongs of uniform widths. She quickly developed a warm relationship with Ika, whose friendly nature made her easy to like. The woman let Ayla carry Borg around when she saw the girl's interest in the baby. Ovra was reserved, but she and Uka were especially kind to her. Their own grief at the loss of the young man in the cave-in made both sibling and mother sensitive to the child's loss of her family. But Ayla had no playmates. Her first flush of friendship with Oga cooled after the ceremony. Oga was torn between Ayla and Browd. The newcomer, although younger, was someone with whom she could have shared her girlish thoughts, and she felt empathetic toward the young orphan since she shared the same fate. But Browd's feelings about her were obvious. Oga reluctantly chose to avoid Ayla in deference to the man she hoped to mate. Except when they worked together, they seldom associated. And after Ayla's attempts at friendship were rebuffed several times, the girl withdrew and made no further efforts to socialize. Ayla didn't like playing with Vorn. Though a year her junior... His idea of playing usually involved ordering her around in conscious imitation of adult male behavior toward adult females, which Ayla still found hard to accept. When she rebelled, it brought down the wrath of both men and women upon her, especially from Aga, Vorn's mother. She was proud that her son was learning to behave just like a man, and she was no less aware of Browd's resentment of Ayla than the rest. Some day, Browd would be leader, and if her son remained in his favor, he might be selected as second in command. Aga used every opportunity to increase her son's stature, to the point of picking on the girl when Browd was near. If she noticed Ayla and Vorn together when Browd was around, she quickly called her son away. Ayla's ability to communicate improved rapidly, especially with the help of the women but it was by her own observation that she learned one particular symbol. She still watched people. She hadn't learned to close her mind to those around her, though she was less obvious about it. One afternoon, she watched Ika playing with Borg. Ika made a gesture to her son and repeated it several times. When the baby's random hand movements seemed to imitate the gesture, she called the other woman's attention to it and praised her son. Later, 
Ayla saw Vorn run up to Aga and greet her with the same gesture. Even Ovra made the motion when beginning a conversation with Uka. That evening, she slowly approached Iza, and when the woman looked up, Ayla made the hand signal. Iza's eyes flew open. Kreb, she said. When did you teach her to call me mother? I didn't teach her that, Iza, Kreb responded. She must have learned it herself. Iza turned back to the girl. Did you learn that yourself? she asked. Yes, mother, Ayla gestured, making the symbol again. She wasn't exactly sure what the hand signal meant, but she had an idea. She knew it was used by children to the women who cared for them. Though her mind had blocked out memories of her own mother, her heart had not forgotten. Isa had replaced that woman whom Ayla had loved and lost. The woman who had been childless for so long felt a surge of emotion. My daughter, Isa said with a rare spontaneous hug. My child. I knew she was my daughter from the first, Kreb. Didn't I tell you? She was given to me. The spirits meant for her to be mine. I'm sure of it. Kreb didn't argue with her. Perhaps she was right. After that evening, the child's nightmares decreased, though she still had them occasionally. Two dreams recurred most frequently. One was of hiding in a small, cramped cave trying to get out of the way of a huge, sharp claw. The other was more vague and more disturbing. There was a sensation of the earth moving, a deep, rolling rumble, and an infinitely painful sense of loss. She cried out in her strange language, used less and less, when she awoke and clung to Isa. When she first came to them, she lapsed into her own tongue sometimes without realizing it. But as she learned to communicate more in the way of the clan, it only came out in her dreams. After a time, it even left her dreams. But she never woke from the haunting nightmare of crumbling earth without a feeling of desolation. The short, hot summer passed, and the light morning frosts of autumn brought a nip to the air and a brilliant splash of scarlet and amber to the verdant forest. A few early snows, sluiced away by heavy seasonal rains that stripped branches of their colorful cloaks, hinted at the coming cold. Later, when only a few tenacious leaves still clung to the bare branches of trees and shrubs, a brief interlude of bright sunshine brought a last reminder of summer heat before the harsh winds and bitter cold closed down most outside activities. The clan was out, savoring the sun. On the broad front exposure of the cave, the women were winnowing grain harvested from the grassy steps below. A brisk wind kicked up an extravagance of dry leaves, lending a semblance of life to the whirling vestiges of summer's fullness. Taking advantage of the gusty air, the women tossed up the grain from wide, shallow baskets, letting the wind carry away the chaff before they caught the heavier seeds. Isa was leaning over behind Ayla, her hands over the girls as she held the basket showing her how to fling the grain high in the air without throwing it out with the husks and bits of straw. Ayla was conscious of Isa's hard, protruding stomach against her back, and felt the strong contraction that made the woman stop suddenly. Shortly afterward, Isa left the group and went into the cave, followed by Ebra and Uka. The girl shot an apprehensive glance at the knot of men who had stopped their conversation and followed the women with their eyes expecting them to reprimand the three women for leaving while there was still work to be done. But the men were inexplicably permissive. Ayla decided to chance their displeasure and followed after the women. In the cave, Iza was resting on her sleeping fur with Ebra and Uka on either side of her. Why is Iza lying down in the middle of the day? Ayla thought. Is she sick? Isa saw the girl's worried look and made a gesture of reassurance, but it didn't ease Ayla's concern. It grew when she saw her adopted mother's strained expression at the next contraction. Ebra and Uka talked with Isa about ordinary things, 
all the food that was stored, the change in the weather. But Ayla had learned enough to pick up their concern from the expressions and posture of the women. Something was wrong, she was sure. Ayla decided nothing would make her leave Isa until she found out what it was, and she sat down near her feet to wait. Toward evening, Ika walked over with Borg on her hip. Then Aga brought her daughter Ona, and both women sat and visited while they nursed, adding their moral support. Ovra and Oga were full of concern and curiosity when they crowded around Isa's bed. Though Uka's daughter was not mated yet, she was a woman, and Ovra knew she could bring forth life now. Oga would soon become a woman, and they were both intensely interested in the process Isa was going through. When Vorn saw Abba go over to sit beside her daughter, he wanted to know why all the women were at Mogur's fire. He wandered over and crawled on Aga's lap beside his sibling to see what was going on, but Ona was still nursing, so the old woman picked up the boy and held him on her lap. He couldn't see anything of great interest, just the medicine woman resting, so he wandered off again. The women started leaving not long afterward, to begin preparing evening meals. Uka stayed with Isa, though Ebra and Oga kept glancing over inconspicuously while they cooked. Ebra served crab as well as Brun, then brought food for Uka, Isa, and Ayla. Ovra cooked for her mother's mate, but she and Oga returned quickly when Grod went over to Brun's hearth to join the leader and crab. They didn't want to miss anything, and sat down beside Ayla, who hadn't stirred from her place. Isa only sipped a little tea, and Ayla wasn't very hungry either. She picked at her food, unable to eat with the tight knot constricting her stomach. What's wrong with Isa? Why isn't she getting up to make Kreb's evening meal? Why isn't Kreb here asking the spirits to make her well? Why is he staying with all the rest of the men at Brun's hearth? Isa was straining harder. Every few moments she took several quick breaths, then pushed hard, holding the hands of the two women. Every member of the clan kept vigil as the night wore on. The men were clustered around the leader's fire, apparently involved in some deep discussion, but the occasional surreptitious glances betrayed their real interest. The women visited periodically, checking on Isa's progress, sometimes staying for a while. They all waited, united in their encouragement and anticipation while their medicine woman labored to give birth. It was well after dark. Suddenly, there was a flurry of activity. Ebra spread out a hide while Uka helped Isa up into a squatting position. She was breathing hard, straining hard, crying out in pain. Ayla was trembling, sitting between Ovra and Oga, who groaned and strained in sympathy with Isa. The woman took a deep breath, and with a long, teeth-gritting, muscle-straining push, the round crown of the baby's head appeared in a gush of water. Another tremendous effort eased out the baby's head. The rest was easier, as Isa delivered the wet, squirming body of a tiny infant. A final push brought forth a mass of bloody tissue. Isa lay down again, exhausted from her labor, while Ebra picked up the baby extracted a gob of mucus from its mouth with her finger, and laid the newborn on Isa's stomach. As she thumped the baby's feet, the infant's mouth opened and a loud squall announced the first breath of life of Isa's first child. Ebra tied a piece of red-dyed sinew around the umbilical cord and bit off the part still attached to the placental mass, then lifted the baby for Isa to see. She got up and went back to her own hearth to report the medicine woman's successful delivery and the gender of the child to her mate. She sat in front of Brun, lowered her head, and looked up at a tap on her shoulder. 